All right, here we go. Chapter 23, Administering Meds. <clears throat> this is going to be Module 9. So this is not on your second test, it's on your third test. I do not own this material under fair use. I'm providing lecture content for my students only. Using this material, all content within is for educational purposes for nursing students and does not provide medical advice. Fabulous. All right, drug names. When you hear a drug name, Tylenol, is that the chemical name? The generic name, the official name, or the brand name? So thought process. Chemical name for Tylenol would be acetaminophen. Generic name, acetaminophen. Official name, probably Tylenol, because that's how most people know it. But that was also the brand name. Okay, so when we talk about mechanisms to promote drug safety, when we talk about where's your drug book, there's multiple references you can use for a drug book. There's a pharmacopoeia, there's formularies, there are nursing drug handbooks, the PDR is referred to quite a bit, that's the physician's drug reference, um, pharmacology texts, electronic internet-based formularies, a clinical pharmacist, the package insert that came with the medication, and institutional medication policies and procedures. So think about this. Who is your resource for all drug questions? You're not gonna call the doctor. You would call the pharmacist they probably know the answer right off the top of their head, okay? Pharmacists are a huge resource to us. Legal considerations, so you know that the U.S. has drug legislation out there that sets the official drug standards for the U.S. It defines prescription drugs versus non-prescription drugs. They regulate controlled substances improving the safety around medications and requires proof of efficacy of medications before they are released. The Nurse Practice Act helps you identify your nursing responsibilities for the administration and client monitoring of any drug that you give. Medication systems, different units, Doses, uh, supply stock, Pixis, right? There's multiple different, depends where you are, depends what you have. Stock supply would be a bulk quantity, like going to your cupboard and grabbing Tylenol out of that big container. Bulk quantity, thousand tablets. In a central location and not client specific. So something that would be a stock med might be Tylenol because it's not it's not necessarily as oversighted, right? So everybody on the floor could potentially be getting Tylenol. It's not like you're a Tylenol in your name, in your drawer, okay? So there are things that will be in bulk quantity. What else could be like that? If you've ever seen like Metamucil on the top of somebody's med cart, everyone's getting their Metamucil out of that container. Not every single patient has those packages in their drawer, okay? So there might be a stock supply, like an insulin. In the old days, we used to have insulin bottles. Everybody used it out of it for the whole floor. Now they usually use the pens, which is not as cost effective, but it's actually more effective in that you know that somebody didn't 
combine insulins, mix up how to mix it, and um, how do you say, uh, um, put the wrong insulin in that bottle, okay? When they were mixing, they didn't accidentally um, conflict the types in the same bottle. Um, unit dose means individually packaged for a specific client in a 24-hour supply. That's what the hospital used to do before Pixis's. So unit dose might be like individualized package that you push the pill through and it's one per the whole month. There's the different dates and the different pills are in each one and it's a bubble pack. You push it through. Or it could be individualized where you get 24 hours of supply. So they send you up three doses in one bag. It's not that you give all three, it's that you're going to be giving that one tablet three times that day. Okay, so every system's a little different. Wherever you go, they will identify what system they're using. Automated dis dispenser. This is the Pixis. So the Pixis is an automated dispenser that we put in our password. It pops out a drawer. We grab those. It's computerized tracked, and it can combine some stock and some unit doses. So when you go to the Pixis, you put in your patient's name, out pops a drawer, you grab that med, you shove it back in, the next drawer pops out, you pick up that med, okay? And there's computerized tracking of who's taking what medication. Then there's self-administrating medication things where there's individual containers and they're kept at the patient's bedside. Pharmokinetics, pharmokinetics, pharma, drug, kinetics, work, movement. What happens to the drug in the body? Pharmokinetics versus pharmodynamics. Pharmodynamics means how does the drug affect the body? What effect does the drug have on the body? versus what happens to the drug in the body. So some pharmacological considerations. Pharmacokinetics will basically be, how does it get used and distributed and gotten rid of? So sometimes medications go through our liver, sometimes medications go through our kidneys. Is it peed out? pooped out, sweated out, how does that drug work in the body? How do we get rid of it later, right? So here lies a little more of that information. There's four processes under pharmacokinetics. It's the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism of that drug, and then the excretion. So absorption means where is it absorbed in the body? Is it absorbed in the mouth, in the mucosa, in the bloodstream, in the belly, in the intestines? Where is it absorbed to work? Distribution means, is it something that goes distributed through the bloodstream or the bowels? How does it get to where it needs to go? How is it distributed? Metabolized means liver or kidneys. How is it metabolized? Or lungs or whatever. Cavity. Metabolism is how is it metabolized? How is it broken down? And then how is it excreted is which way is it going? Is it going out the poop? Or is it going out the urine? Is it going out sweat? Is it going out breath? Well, how is it excreted from the body? Absorption, movement of the drug in the bloodstream. Some factors that absorb, um, affect absorption differently. The route of the administration. If it's going in my eye, 
if it's going in my ear, route of administration is how did it get in the body? Was it oral? Was it odic? Was it oral? Eyes. Was it nose? Was it inhaled? The drug solubility. How soluble was it? Was it a tablet? Was it a liquid? Was it a gas? The pH in the eye is ionization. So things have a pH, things have an ion. Is it a positive ion or a negative ion? Os positives attract, negatives attract, positive and negative repel, right? Blood flow, how much blood flow is in that area? How does that medicine get into the blood flow? Distribution, how does it transport to the tissues and organs? Is it local blood flow, membrane permeability, protein binding capacity? So think about distribution to the cells. How does the drug get out to the cells and the organs? If there's low blood flow, it's not going to get there very fast. A lot of drugs go across membranes, especially IV fluids. Anything that has a word and sodium, sodium follows water. That's how it gets across. Okay. Metabolism. How does it get chemically converted? Some things that would affect that liver function, kidney function. Health disease status and the first pass effect. The first pass effect is kind of like a half-life. How quickly does the med take effect? Excretion. How do we get rid of it once we have it in the body? Is it through the kidney, the liver, the lungs, the exocrine glands? How do we get rid of the drug? Most drugs are through the kidneys and the liver. Some can be through the lungs, but how does it leave the body? That is a big thing because if it's excreted through the kidneys and they have high blood pressure, it might take a while to get that med out because it's under such high pressure in the kidneys, water retention. If it's in the liver and they're stopped up constipated, it might take a long time to get out of the body. If they have diarrhea, it's not going to take so long. So clicker check. The patient has been on a low protein diet. This will most likely affect which pharmacokinetic process? Low protein. How is that going to affect low protein? That's probably not going to affect the absorption. Excretion, eh, low protein, that's good. High protein might affect my kidneys. Metabolism, how does a metabolism have to do with protein? Protein distribution, if it's a fat soluble vitamin. So, a low protein diet might lead to inadequate level of plasma proteins, proteins in your blood, which would affect the availability of free drug. Okay? Like, talk about fat-soluble vitamins. You need a fat to, uh, to dissolve those. If you're on a low-fat diet, that's not going to work so well. If it's a water-soluble vitamin, it's going to leave the body fast if they're peeing a lot, okay? Some other concepts related to pharmacokinetics. The time of onset and the time of peak. These are two big things that you need to know. What's the time of onset of Tylenol? I'm hoping 30 minutes so I can get rid of this headache, okay? The time of onset is how long before it starts to work. 
which is typically the answer, the question that most people want the answer to when you give them pain medicine. What that depends on is how the drug is given. If it's IV push, it's going to be quick. If it's a suppository, it could be a while. Okay? Especially if they're constipated. <laughs> it's going to take a while to melt and get working. The peak means at what point has it reached its maximum effective capacity, and now it's coming back down in my bloodstream. Okay? Peak is the peak time that it's effective. How long is this going to last before it starts coming back down and I'm going to start feeling the pain again? Okay, so if you know that you have an order to take Tylenol every four to six hours, somewhere the peak is somewhere between four and six hours because that's why you can pick another dose. The peak's probably about two and it's coming back down and then it's safe to take another dose. Okay. Therapeutic range, we talk a lot about with antibiotics, okay? One in particular, vancomycin. Vancomycin can ruin your kidneys. I don't want to do that to someone, so I'm very careful when I'm giving this medication that I know when peak is, when trough is, and when therapeutic level has been achieved. So any medication that could hurt your body, we know the peak, we know when it's troughing, the low and the high of the drug. So with vancomycin, you will do a peak and a trough around a dose to find out if we're in therapeutic level. So a trough would be between doses, a peak would be at the peak effectiveness of that medication. So if I hang my antibiotic, I need to know when I need to draw the peak, and then when can I do the trough again. Peaks and troughs are very important to be drawn on time. If the peak is not where we need it to be, or if the trough is too high of a level, I'm killing kidney, I'm killing liver, I'm killing things. So I don't want the trough to be too high, and I don't want the peak to be too low. If my peak's too low, it's not enough antibiotic to kill my bug. If my trough is too high, I'm probably killing my kidneys and liver if I continue to give more med. So the peaks and the troughs tell us when we are in that therapeutic range. The biological half-life is the half-life of any drug in your body. So you need to know half-life so that you can understand when is it going to peak and when is it going to trough. The half-life of any drug will tell you how often you're going to have to give it. If the half-life of a medication is 24 hours, it's probably going to be once a day. If the half-life of the medication is five minutes, you're going to be sitting by the bedside giving that every couple minutes. The concentration of active drug. What's the concentration of the active drug in that medication? So there are different um, medications like pain med that have different concentrations of the active drug in it. So if I have one tablet of Percocet, it could have 5 slash 325, and the next one have 10 slash 650. It's the concentration of the active drug in there. Percocet is half oxycodone, half Tylenol. So the first number is how much oxycodone is in it. The second number is how much Tylenol is in it. The concentration of the active drug changes between those two tablets. Factors that affect pharmacokinetics. Everything on this screen, right? Age. Why does age? Smaller body mass, larger body mass. Age. Slowing down of kidneys and liver. Tons of stuff to think about. Body weight. Body mass. Small body surface area. Large body surface area. Large fat deposits. 
with a fat-soluble vitamin could be a big difference with a 90-pound grandma and 900-pound. Gender. Boys and girls break down meds differently. Pregnancy. Pregnancy is going to affect your pharmacokinetics. Environment. Route of admission. Administration. So, route of administration, like I said, IV push is probably going to be the fastest or potentially sublingual. Sublingual is going to be every three minutes, right? A nitroglycerin tab, every three to five minutes, you can repeat that. That route is very quick under the tongue because it goes right into the bloodstream. If you don't have an IV site, sublingual is probably going to be faster before you start the IV. How else could you give medication? IM, sub-Q, oral, NG, peg tube, rectally. So it all depends how you're giving the med. The timing of administration matters. Timing of administration, let me just tell you, thyroid hormone needs to be given on an empty stomach. It matters because when you bring breakfast tray and you give them their thyroid at the same time as their breakfast tray, the protein, the calcium in the milk, the bacon protein on the tray, and the iron tablet you have in there is going to make that medication much less effective. The timing of administration matters. Think about caraphate, something used to coat the stomach. Do you want to coat the stomach before the meal and keep the acid at bay? Or do you want to give the medication with the meal? What is the purpose of the med? If it's to coat the stomach, you better do it before. How long before? 30 minutes. So that it shuts off the acid pumps. Fluids affect medications because most medications are sodium-based or potassium-based or whatever. Sodium follows water in and out of the cells. So the amount of fluid that's available will change the pharmacokinetics. If you're dehydrated and constipated, that's going to be changing the whole pharmacokinetics than if you have watery diarrhea. Pathological states. The pathopharm behind why you're giving the med makes a difference. Genetic factors. Psychological factors. Pharmacodynamics, effects of drugs. The primary effect is the therapeutic effect. Why are we giving it? What do we expect to see? The predicted effect, the intended effect, the desired effect. Why was the drug prescribed? That's the primary effect. If I give colase, the intended effect is to soften stool. If I give Tylenol, the intended effect is to stop my pain. So it just depends why you're giving the drug. Secondary effects are side effects, adverse reactions, toxic reactions, allergic reactions, idiosyncratic reactions, cumulative effect, things unattended, unintended, side effects of the med. If I take Benadryl, yes, I'm going to stop itching, antihistamine, stop the itch, but I'm also going to fall asleep, potentially while driving, not wanted, side effect, okay? Drug interactions occur. Are they antagonistic or synergistic? Are they incompatible? Question for you. Antagonist. Against each other. 
if your brother antagonizes you, he bothers you. So some medications antagonize each other. Think about this. When we give a pain medicine, it usually causes nausea. Some pain medicine have a nausea component to it. So that we know that's going to happen, we're also going to give you this. Okay? Antagonist, opposite effect. Synergist, in synergy, working together, working even better. Okay? Some pain medicines have oxycodone and Tylenol. The oxycodone is going to work fast. The Tylenol is going to work longer. They help each other out. Incompatibilities mean they're incompatible with each other. A drug interaction that's incompatible. Typical one. If you put some medication in some IV fluids, they will turn the fluid like a snow globe, literally. If you were to shoot Dilantin into a drug bag, an IV bag, of the wrong fluid, those two drugs are incompatible. The sodium in that fluid would cause it to crystallize, and you would end up with a snow globe in your IV bag. That's fine if you notice it and stop the infusion. If you walk out because it's late at night and you don't pay attention to this, you could have an emergency on your hands because IV fluid is not supposed to have snowflakes in it. Drug abuse or misuse. Tolerance. If you keep taking the same drug, you could become tolerant to it. You could become dependent on it. You could misuse it. You could abuse it, especially illicit drugs. Illicit drugs are ones that are used for purposes not intended. Measure and calculate doses. So you know that we use the metric system, milliliters, the apothecary system, ounces, household system, teaspoon, tablespoon, units for like insulin, heparin, certain meds, and milli equivalents. So potassium is not like in milligrams, it's in milli equivalents. Magnesium is in milligrams or grams. Potassium is so small that it's measured in milli equivalents. So when you hang a bag and it's D5 one half with 20 of K, the 20 means 20 milli equivalents. It's a small, small, small measure. Calculating doses. There are four ways to solve every problem, right? You can use ratio proportion. You can use solving for x. You can use nonograms. You can use Clark's rule. You can use dimensional analysis. There are many ways to calculate doses. Does it matter how you calculate it, or does it matter that two people get the same answer? When you are checking a component of a medical prescription, when you look at a medical prescription, a prescription bottle, you should see the name of the patient, full name, the date and the time, the name of the medication, the dosage size, frequency, and number of doses on the bottle the route of administration, and the printed name and signature of the prescriber with their DEA number as needed. 
that's on a prescription. The thing that they hand you, which typically is already automatically sent to the pharmacy, right? But if you had one in your hand, taking it to the pharmacy, this is what a complete prescription sounds like. Medication prescriptions that we take in the hospital should be written, transcribed. They should have an automatic stop date, which is usually in the hospital like a week out because most people don't stay in the hospital more than a week. There should be a stat prescription. Stat means now. Don't think twice. Don't pass go. Something that is stat needs to happen now. That takes priority over everything else. Stat nitroglycerin. I cannot tell you the day that a nurse got her butt handed to her by a doctor. The doctor said stat nitro. She said, well, I got some other meds to get. There's a disconnect between the communication here. There is no other meds you need to give right now, except that nitroglycerin when somebody orders it stat. Single prescription means times one now. That's how it's written. It's a single dose. You cannot repeat it without getting another doctor's order. So if somebody said nitro times one now, that means give one dose, but you are not able to repeat it. So if you needed another nitro, you'd have to ask again for another prescription. A one-time antibiotic. A one-time dose of two milliliter, uh, milligrams of morphine to get them out of pain. A single prescription means one time, that's it, you're done. You got to call back to get another order. A standing prescription. A standing prescription is kind of like a standing order. It's a group of orders that the doctors at the hospital have all agreed upon that all of these kind of patients will get this drop down on their mark. Standing prescription. If I put on blood sugar Q6 hours with sliding scale coverage, I do not have to think about which sliding scale coverage the doctor wants because it will automatically fall down on my patient's record. So there are certain things that are standing prescriptions. Oxytocin to stop bleeding after delivery. There is a standing order for Pitocin, one liter bolus if bleeding. That means the nurse can go get that and start bolusing it, call the doctor, let him know we're hemorrhaging. If we didn't have those orders in OB, we'd have a lot more maternal morbidity. So there will be things that are standing orders, standard prescriptions. So if a doctor orders a potassium, there may be standing orders to replace that potassium per protocol. Per protocol means you go to the cabinet or you look in your MAR and the pharmacy is already put in, if the potassium is this amount, start replacing potassium this way. They are standing orders, standard orders for every patient. A ER could have a standing order, a standing prescription for a urinary tract infection. If you suspect urinary tract infection, they automatically want you to get a UA CNS. It's just the right thing, right? The other thing is there could be a standing order for an EKG if somebody comes in complaining of chest pain. It's something that the doctors have determined they want on every one of those kind of patients that come in. Sometimes they're standing prescriptions in the OR if it's a joint replacement because they want to have every single person MRSA tested 
prior to surgery. So that means you take a swab and you swab their nose and you send it to the lab so that we know if they had MRSA, MRSA, prior to surgery so that we know if it was hospital acquired or home acquired. A PRN prescription, what does PRN mean? As needed. So when a patient tells you, oh, when will you be back with my med? And you notice that it's a PRN, you have to tell them when you call me. Because it is not like an around the clock prescription that you're just gonna show up at their door at 612, 612. A PRN is if needed, Tylenol, eye drops, things like that that are not necessarily needed every day, a sleeping pill, will be ordered PRN, which is, I have the order, I can give it when needed, but I'm not going to go through every single patient and go give their pill just because they have it. If they want a sleeping pill at night, it would be written QHS. That means every hour of sleep. That would be every night, go give it. If it's PRN and they say, hey, you know what? It's 1 a.m., I haven't slept yet. I just don't know what's, what I'm gonna do. You can look on your order sheet and say, oh, by the way, I have a sleeping pill if you want one. Oh, why didn't you say so? because it's PRN. <laughs> All right, nursing considerations with communication of prescriptions. They can be either handwritten, pre-printed, oral, or by telephone. Handwritten prescriptions are handwritten, handed to the patient. Pre-printed are pre-printed ones handed to the patient to take to the pharmacy. Pre-printed might be a standing order, an order set that gets thrown down on your bar. Oral order would be in the hallway, he told me to order this. I, as the nurse, have to go in and put it in to cover myself. By telephone is a telephone order, and I must read it back to the provider because I have to write it put it in the chart, it's on me. In this day and age of computer order entry, that is called medical order entry, which the medical provider should be doing. So at all possible to reduce the risk of med errors, you should always ask them, are you gonna put that in? It's not my job to, I can, but it's not my job to. Medication order errors happen because we don't read back. If somebody tells you an order, you read it back to them, you write it down, you go to a computer and put it in. All right, a nurse is having trouble deciphering the medication prescription written by the provider. What is the best strategy to clarify the information? Ask the patient what medication the provider prescribed. Eh, they're never going to remember. <sighs> Call the pharmacist and ask them to read it. <laughs> Probably not. Ask the nurse who knows the provider's handwriting to read the prescription. Is that really best practice? Why don't we call the doctor and ask them to clarify the prescription? If you ever have a question, what in the heck does he mean? You need to call the provider. The rest is passing the buck. Doesn't matter how long you've been working with that physician. If you can't read their writing, that's a problem. This is why we have computer order entry. All right. A nurse manager is investigating several near misses and an increase in med errors on the unit. The nursing staff discusses that they are having difficulty reading the handwriting of a particular provider. They convey that she becomes very annoyed when asked to clarify her prescriptions 
and on several occasions stated, I'm sure you'll figure it out. The nurses have been having other nurses interpret the prescriptions. What do you think about this? What should be your initial actions? You're the nurse manager. Go to the source, right? What are you going to do? One, you're going to have those nurses write up an incident report. You're going to take down names and quotes of what's going on. And you're going to go back to that doctor. What safety concerns are evident in this scenario? We're going to talk more about this in 338. This is one, disrespect. Two, not safety. Three, disobedience. This can get you in big trouble. People should be able to question what's going on, what does this say, with no failure or threat of retribution. I'm sure you'll figure it out. That is not player friendly. What's the options available to the provider? What options are available to the provider? Here's the option. Write the order in the computer. Computer order entry is the reason this happens, right? This happened, that's why we do computer order entry. Put the order in the computer. We don't write handwritten things anymore. Med error, lack of knowledge or information, faulty communication, equipment errors, calculation and measurement errors, and other. This is why we have med errors. Computer order entry, CPOE, means that the doctor puts in the orders so that there is no miscommunication on that. There's barcode med admin, which means we use the scanners at the bedside to make sure that we're in the right room at the right time with the right drug. See where I'm going with that? Don't use the workaround. Smart pumps. Our pumps now tell us, are you sure? Are you sure? You're breaking the guardrail. You're breaking the guardrail. And if you keep poo-pooing on those little uh, warnings that pop up, it's on you. Automated dispensing cabinets. Pixis. This is how we prevent errors from happening. Take two seconds. Close the med room door, no distractions, and pull your meds. If you are distracted, stop and start again when you're not distracted. Okay. What should I do if I commit a med error? Fess up. Write yourself an incident report. Because more times than not, you didn't show up to work to make an error. It was systems that set you up for error, which will set up another nurse for error as well. So immediately assess the patient's vitals. Take a physical status, right? Who's our first priority? The patient that got affected by these meds. Assess, diagnose, intervene. So the diagnosis part comes from calling to the doctor, letting him know what happened. He can tell us what the antidote is or what he wants us to do about it. And then identify the nurse manager. Go ahead and put in an incident report. They will follow up with you, of course. 
so you can save yourself uh, a phone call at 9 a.m. when you just went to sleep if you email them and let them know. You might even, um, you know, follow your policy, but you might even just send that email also to risk management because they will be looking for what happened, which is not a bad thing. It's institutionally what happened. How did the error occur? It's usually a system error, not a person error. So when do we do our checks? All the time. Assessment. How do you assess your meds? Before pulling them out on the mar, during the pullout of meds, and after the pullout of meds. We're constantly asking about medications that the patient's on. We're talking about medication history. We're talking about physical exam. Every single piece of this is an assessment. Assess, assess, assess. For some reason, I'm stuck. Let's see what we can do. There we go. All right. So the analysis and the nursing diagnosis behind the injury risk. Injury risk of polypharmacy. I don't know how many times you're going to find out that the patient is on Lasix and something else, and something else, and those things are all working against each other. Polypharmacy means going from one doctor to the next, getting another prescription, and multiple prescriptions for the same thing, okay? Misuse, overuse, underuse. Non-adherence to the medication regimen, of course, Think about your diabetic, right? If they're non-adherent to taking their insulin or taking too much of it. Any medication can be that, like that. The planning outcome intervention, it depends on the, on the nursing diagnosis and the med that happens, right? There are some meds, if you gave too much vitamin C, what's going to happen? It's going to pee it out. It's a water-soluble vitamin, okay? Some things it's not going to matter. Some things it is going to matter. If you give a patient Tylenol instead of um, ibuprofen, is it going to matter? It depends. How do you teach medication self-administration? That means the medication being self-administered to the patient. So what do you have to do? You have to know and understand what they're taking. Take the drug as prescribed. You tell them to communicate with their provider, to think about safety. A lot of this happens around discharge. If we're discharging them on a narcotic, we also need to talk to them about not driving. Okay? Some people don't realize that. And some of those accidents that you see in the newspaper are people who are driving on a narcotic because no one told them that they couldn't drive. Administer the drugs correctly. How do you know that? Well, before they go home, can you observe them giving their meds correctly? This is especially important with inhalers. If you have time, I want you to go to YouTube and search the video house md asthma guarantee you teach back is going to be on the end clicks store your drugs safely i will give you the caveat on the end clicks on any test particularly on the pediatric test what does that sound like a locked drawer it does not matter if you have drugs in the top drawer of your dresser 
if the child can get up on a chair and still get to them. It does not matter if grandma has her narcotics on the counter, if her nieces and nephews come to borrow some. The reason why we have a drug problem is because people borrow people's meds, borrow, I'm using that term largely, Maintain your supply. What's the worst thing that can happen during a hurricane? Someone runs out of their insulin. So you want to maintain your supply. In other words, fill your prescriptions regularly. Typically during the hurricane, you will hear DeSantis put out an emergency so that they can fill your prescriptions early as needed because we don't know how bad it's going to be. Think about those people down in Fort Myers. They were weeks without refrigeration. Some of their meds were no longer any good. They may have run out of oxygen as well. All right, so three checks. We will talk about this again in, in lab too. You are always doing three checks. So before you pour, you're pulling the med label against the MAR. The MAR is your medication administration record. So you're checking when you're pulling the med. After you pour, when you put it in the little bucket, you're verifying the label once more against the MAR. And then again at the bedside before you give the med, you're checking the med again there at the bedside when you're scanning it, opening it, and giving it to the patient. Remember I said pour the med, which means putting it in the plastic container in a med bucket, not opened, because if it's not opened, you can put it back. If it's opened, you cannot put it back in the Pixis. Do not open any med before you get to the patient's bedside because what if you come in with a bucket of pills and he says, I don't know what that red one is. Now you don't know what it is either. I don't want my Lasix today. How are you going to remember which one was the Lasix? Don't open meds until you pour them at the bedside after you scan the barcode Keep everything, especially if you pull out from a syringe, a vial. Make sure you take the vial to the bedside because they're going to ask you to scan it. Okay? Don't throw anything away until you're done giving that bed. A vial especially. You'll be picking out of the trash to get your vial. All right. So there are some rights. There are now six to remember. So when you're looking at a drug, when you're ready to give it, you are asking yourself, is it the right drug, the right dose, at the right time, using the right route, how to get it in the body, for the right patient, hand it to the patient. They have a right to a reason why they're taking it. They have the right to know what they're taking and a right to refuse. Then you take that med out of there that they refused. You document that you refused it. And then you document that on that MAR you're giving all those other meds. So right documentation is last. I would tell you right education too, right? So you're constantly educating all along. So some different routes we talked about oral. This is the most commonly used route because it's the least invasive. So that includes tablets, capsules, liquids, buccal, buccal meaning in the cheek. There are meds that need to be in the cheek. There are some that need to be under the tongue, two different places. Buccal, buccal cavity in the cheek sublingual under the tongue, and then enteral medications. If you think about enteral, it's something going through a 
solution. Enteral, enteral nutrition through the stomach. Through the stomach, so a peg tube. Okay. Medications that are liquid that go through the peg tube, including formula. Whatever the formula of choice is that you're feeding them with. Topical medications are applied to body surfaces or body cavities. Topical, think lotions, creams, ointments. Could also be transdermal patches through the skin. Transdermal. Um, that could be nitroglycerin patches. That could be stop smoking patches. That could be pain med patches. Eye and ear. Nasal, vaginal, and rectal. Know all of those. Respiratory inhalations. Usually using a nebulizer. We will talk to you about nebulizers. Nebulizers mean that you're hooking it up in a nebulizer through forced air, which makes it into small, small particles on the air. So absorption there is through the alveoli in the lung and the blood supply. So you might see an atomizer, you might see an aerosol, or you might see a metered dose inhaler. We will do this in the lab, don't get nervous. Parental, parental, Intradermal, in the skin, through the skin, transdermal, through the skin. Subcutaneous, under the first fat layer, in the fat. Subcutaneous is insulin, heparin. Intramuscular, in the muscle, IM injection, vaccines, shots. Intravenous in the vein, IV fluid, IV push drugs. Parental in the vein, in the skin. Okay. Equipment needed syringes and needles of different sizes and gauges. Gauges is how big it is. Size is how wide or how long the needle is. So caveat, the higher up the number in a needle, the smaller the opening. So an 18 gauge, a 16 gauge is huge. A 23 gauge is tiny. Then they come in one inch, two inch, three inch, right? Whatever. What do you need that large of a needle for? Okay. Just because you have two inches of needle does not need you mean you need to use two inches of needle. Medication prep. We'll go through this in the lab. Vials and ampules. Vials are glass covered with a stopper. Ampules are all glass. We'll do this. Don't worry yet. Reconstituting from a powder, you did those in, in on MedMath day, right? The beginning of MedMath, you reconstituted from a powder. We'll do that again in the lab. Two medications in one syringe. How do you mix medications in one syringe? That's usually insulins, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about mixing insulins. Safety issue. You've got a sharp in your hand. One needle, one time, one use. Do not recap a needle. We will show you safe ways to be able to get rid of that needle, but recapping is not going to be it. Use the correct site. The wrong site could mean the right, wrong route. So I cannot tell you this enough. If you're doing an IM injection, 
you better be using the right site. If you have three milliliters of fluid, that's way too much to go in one muscle. There are small muscles and large muscles. If you're giving a vaccine, that's okay in the arm because it's only 0.5 cc's. But if you're giving an antibiotic and it's a cc and a half, you better be giving it to me in my butt because that will hurt the next day in my arm. You can cause major damage doing that. And then be familiar with techniques required for the medication. So there are special techniques for heparin and insulin, and we'll talk about that in the lab. Heparin, you do not want to use your, your alcohol swab after and rub it. That's going to make it bleed under the skin and cause a big boo-boo. Insulin, do you want to pinch? Do you not want to pinch? Do you want to use the alcohol or not? Okay, questions we will cover in the lab. IV meds. So when we talk about IV meds, that might be an IV push, an IV piggyback, or a medicated drip. We'll talk about these. IV push means a small amount of fluid in a syringe. I go in over what many minutes I need to push it. I stop the IV fluid, I push the med, and then I start the IV fluid back up. I push in a method of SAS, saline drug administration, saline. IV piggyback, a small amount of fluid in a little bag, antibiotics usually, that goes in piggybacking into my mainline fluid. Medicated drip, potassium, something like that. A medicated drip usually is in the ICU, but it can be in the floor. Heparin, medicated drip, a drip of fluid that's going much slower than a mainline fluid with much concentrated drug in it. All right, clicker check. When administering a drug per parental route, the drug would be absorbed fastest if given per the IM route. True or false? Fastest way to get meds into your body. What do you think? Going with faults because IV would be fastest straight into the bloodstream. IM is going to take a while. So absorption means movement of the drug into the bloodstream. IV is instant absorption. Your onset's going to be a minute max, maybe even less. All right, safe and effective nursing care. A student nurse calls the nurse at 4 o'clock and reports that at 3 o'clock, their instructor gave the med for patient A to patient B and the medication for patient B to patient A. The student then hung up. The instructor did not report a medication error and is no longer on the unit. What's the nurse's best next best action? If the nurse nursing instructor is no longer on the floor, I probably need to call them, but what's my first priority? My first priority is not finding a person and figuring it out. My first priority is going to look up those meds after I take a set of vitals on the patient. Make sure the patient's stable. What did I give them, right? Go to the patient first, get a set of vitals, make sure everybody's okay, look up the drugs, find out what happened, call the doctor, blah, blah.
A. Email the instructor an incident report and request that they return the completed report in 24 hours. No. I don't see anything about a patient there. Review the medication administration record for each patient prior to performing an assessment. Contact each patient's provider to report the medica medication error and request guidance. That doesn't tell me that they're stable. What, what's he going to ask? Well, what's, what do they look like, right? Email the risk manager to report possible unreported med error. Later. What's our first priority? The patient. What do you want to do? Review the med record. Perform an assessment. Call the doctor. Right? Whatever order you want to put it in, I would go to the patient and make sure they were okay first. But I also need to know what she gave, right? Because if it was a once a day multivitamin, whatever. Okay? Yes, it's going to be a med error, but it's not preventing anything from happening right now. What I want to know is, was there a blood thinner? Was there a blood pressure medicine? Was there narcotics? What is it in there that's causing, right? If nothing could have caused anything, just go do an assessment and report it. I'm worried about my patient, to be quite honest with you. I'm definitely worried about Worried about my patient. All right. That's enough med math for now.